Welcome to the Gavul, I'm Terry Ikumi, and here's your weekly update on the National Assembly. This week, we're doing some throwbacks, beginning with the Constitution Amendment. Now, when Parliament resumes in September, the Constitution Amendment process is expected to be prioritized and hopefully concluded in time before the political year 2026. And one key amendment that's been canvassed in the state policing system and with what seems like the president's support for it, it is believed that it will be attained unlike the last assembly. So here's a quick look at the dialogue session of the House on state police, which held sometime in April. Earlier this year, the National Assembly constituted the 1999 Constitution Amendment Committees for both chambers to be chaired by the Deputy Senate President and Deputy Speaker, respectively. The President of the Senate, Senator Godzilla Pabio, underscored the need for the Senate to review aspects of the Constitution against the backdrop of current realities. He stated that a committee would comprise one senator from each state and one from each geopolitical zone of the country and is expected to be inaugurated on February 20. There is need for us to touch on some aspects of the Constitution uh, to bring them in line with current realities particularly with the era of artificial intelligence. We are taking one senator per state, because we are talking about a constitutional amendment. One senator per state, and then we are also taking one senator representing each geopolitical zone. Meanwhile, as the National Assembly prepares for another round of constitution amendment, the House of Representatives convened a stakeholders dialogue on state policing system in April this year. Former Head of State General Abdusalami Abubakar, former President Goodluck Jonathan, federal lawmakers, security agencies, members of the diplomatic corps, traditional and religious leaders attended the one-day policy dialogue. There are lots of people who are very, very anxious that the police be reformed, that the police be given more powers, uh, be given more responsibility. Perhaps that the way to go might actually be to decentralize the police in a way that ensures that the decentralization of the police safeguards it from abuse. The prospect of a state-level policy architecture, which is at the heart of this dialogue, is paramount given the imperatives of addressing the scourge of crime, insurgency, and various forms of violence that are impacting on Nigeria's development trajectory, thereby presenting a threat to the well-being and safety of all citizens. The state police bill was rejected by federal lawmakers who feared that the state governors may abuse the system. It appears the federal legislature is shifting grounds just as former heads of state throw their weight behind the creation of state police to address the security concerns across the country. As we explore the models of state policy that have been successful in other nations, we must be judicious in adopting these frameworks to fit our unique Nigerian situation. We are not going to debate and we should not waste our time debating whether we should have state police or not. Listening to the speaker, he gave the history, even in this country, we operated it before. Why is that the military scrapped it? Because of the abuse. And that is the area we should concentrate on. As much as we are talking of uh, establishing state police, we should do also look into the role vis-a-vis -vis of our royal fathers. The current police leadership and the parent ministry, however, appeared not to be in accord on the matter of state police. I will emphasize that state police can enhance local responsiveness, improve crime prevention, and threaten security at the, grass, at the grassroots level. I will recommend an institutional and legal framework that delineates the roles responsibilities and jurisdiction of state police forces within the broader national security architecture. It is the submission of the leadership of the Nigerian police force that Nigeria is yet to mature and ready for the establishment of state control police. This is due to the underlying reasons. One, adequate there is no adequate resources in place for police infrastructure. 
Again, there are potential for abuse of power by state political leadership. The representative of the IGP would later release a statement clarifying that his presentation was his position and not that of the IGP. For President Bola Tinubu, who was represented by his vice, deliberations on state police must be thorough to produce workable resolutions. The president deserves commendation for his openness and proactive stance towards the idea of reforming and decentralizing the police force. The concept of state policing is not merely a policy proposal, but a potential milestone in the evolution of our law enforcement framework. Now, I did say in the beginning that we would do some throwbacks today as we prepare for the resumption of plenary in a couple of weeks. So here's a chat with the Senate leader on the 10th Senate on whether or not it is just an extension of the presidency. When it comes to executive and, and uh, legislative uh, interaction, this is not a time to grandstand. What a lot of people, or what some people expect to see is sheer grandstanding. You get up on the floor of the, of the Senate or the House of Reps and say all manners of things, you know, as much as we can lambast the executive arm of government and they bring in their bills, you throw it, the, the bills back at them, they bring in the budget, you, you, you know, do everything to make you look as if it's a budget that cannot work, you know. Where you have reasons to do that, you do it. But the truth about it is primarily we're all engaged in a situation now where we're trying to say, how can we make this? you know, country work. What do we have to do to ensure that the entire roof does not collapse on our heads? It's no longer about who is right and who is left, uh, wrong. It's no longer about us. That's politicians or people who are privileged to be in government, in whichever arm of government. It's not about our people. It's not about our economy. It's not about how we can make things work. How do we fix this economy? How do we ensure that we give hope back to Nigerians? How do we ensure that those Nigerians who out of frustration, you know, uh, left this country or are still planning to leave this country, you know, are made to believe in Nigeria again? You know, these are the issues for us. And the best way to achieve um, our desire in this, in this regard it's not by confronting the executive arm of government. As I will always say, the constitution is very clear as to where the role of each arm of government begins and where it ends. But mind you, that same constitution that provides clearly for separation of powers also makes adequate provision you know, for checks and balances and for collaboration. You have an executive arm of government that is the spending authority. But that is not the approving authority. And that's where the parliament comes in. Even the money that will be spent by the parliament will be proposed and initiated by the executive arm in its budget. You have a, a, a judicial arm of government that is in a position to shut down laws made by the legislative arm of government because they have reason to believe that such a law cannot work or cannot stand the test of time. And it's for the parliament to either go by that case law decision or go back into the chamber to reenact the law. You know, So we, you have all these checks and balances in place. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, they're working. But what some people just want to see is, like I said, grandstanding, which is not what we need today. Now, when you talk about collaboration, I mean, I was a member of the Ninth Senate. We were called rubber stamps for this same similar reason. Now, we were rubber stamped, but we achieved a lot. All manners of legislation, very significant legislation that had been pending for several assemblies, some from the fourth assembly, 
up to the night assembly and those parliament couldn't pass them we passed them a, a good example of that was the the pib uh, petroleum industry bill that was signed into law and with P, P, petroleum industry act today that was passed by the national assembly in the ninth assembly you now have a legal framework that governs the oil and gas regime that brings us closer to global best practice standard that makes you know i mean practices within the oil and gas industry predictable and i mean investors can relate better to what we are doing in that industry we were meant to be rubber stamps as rubber stamp uh, assembly we were able to also break the jinx of not being able to pass national budget until May or sometimes June eh, of a new year, we were able to bring it to a situation where before the last day of December of every year, consistently for four years, we were able to pass the appropriation bill. Are you, are you satisfied with you know operations in the Senate right now? Because uh, we hear talks of disenchantment. There are as many opinions as there are people. And this is a parliament. It's a parliament that is very unique in that for the first time you have seven political parties producing the membership of the senate alone and then of course same story in the house of reps so you have seven distinct and divergent political party interests but one thing that I'm happy about is that the 109 of us have come to a conclusion that the various political parties that brought us were vehicles through which we got here. And that once you are sworn in as a senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, you know, um, your, your, your allegiance is first and foremost to the Federal Republic of Nigeria through the Constitution. And whatever that can cause divisions among us, you know, must not be allowed. Yes, uh, were people, were some people not too happy about committees? These are some of the things that happen in parliament. Nigeria is not an exclusive uh, uh, preserve. It's not an ex exclusive preserve of Nigeria. Uh, we have 72 committees. There are one or nine of us. And we also live in a nascent democracy where some committees are still deemed as juicy. Uh, I mean, whatever that might mean, you know. So, and how many of such committees that people... So, if you have 72 committees and you have 109 uh, senators, all right, so already you have a, a, a good number of senators who will not be committee chairman, regardless of who you voted for. All right. Even if all the 109 senators voted for one person, because it was the only one contest, it was not, it was returned or post, you will still have, you know, uh, 22 at least uh, committee chairmen and uh, senators who will not be committee chairmen. All right. It's even slightly better in the Senate than in the House of Reps, because in the Senate, every one of us will at least be a vice chairman of a committee. You know, some. I will also be chairman and vice chairman based on the number, all right? We even try to create more. We look at, you know, uh, um, certain committees following what had happened in the executive arm of government that had tried to split some of the ministries. We have committee on youth and sports, and we say, wait, in the executive arm, now they have honorable minister of sport, they have honorable minister of youth, you know, they're on their own. They had decided to split that ministry into two. Let's do the same thing here. We have committee on on uh, culture, <clears throat> arts, culture, and tourism. I will say, wait a minute. In the executive, now they have ministry of tourism, they have ministry of culture. So let's do the same thing here. Uh, in the area of mineral development, <clears throat> they decide the executive had, had uh, tried to split it. You now have steel development. You now have mineral development. We did the same thing here. Following all of this, we ended up <clears throat> with five additional committees. Even at that, that is 79 out of 109. 
So whichever way you look at it, there will always be people who will feel, you know what, I, I deserve to get more than I got, you know, and all that. But those are not things that uh, we can over celebrate because the things that unite us as senators are more than the things that tend or seem to divide us. Welcome back to the Gavul. Our first report today looked at the state policing system, which is one of the proposed constitution amendments before the National Assembly. On the breakdown, the Policy and Legal Advocacy Center looks at more bills before the National Assembly Constitution Amendment Committees. Here's a Marachon Yabo program officer for Plaque with the breakdown. Assembly began its process of constitution review from the beginning of 2024 when the Senate and House of Representatives constituted their respective constitution review committees. Several bills have since come before both houses of the National Assembly and we're going to be discussing some key bills that are before the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, the first one is the Parliamentary System of Government, a bill proposing that Nigeria moves from federalism to the parliamentary system of government. Now, the reason that has been canvassed is the cost of governance and the need to streamline institutions of government. However, if this proposal is to pass, it would also mean amending several provisions of the Constitution because the Constitution has been drafted, premised on a federal system of government. Now, it's essential for us as a people to ask ourselves if the main problem is the system of government or the people who make up the system and the administration of this federal system of government. Another bill is on election adjudication. It has been argued that election adjudication takes a long time. Some people have even proposed that election petitions, especially for presidential elections, should be concluded before swearing in a new president in order to avoid the distraction that election litigation brings for a newly elected president. The legislative election petitions are usually heard by tribunals and uh, they have a right of appeal to the Court of Appeal. For the presidential election petition, it begins at the Court of Appeal with a right of appeal to the Supreme Court. However, for governorship elections, this is different because they start at the tribunal they can go on to the Court of Appeal and even up until the Supreme Court. Now, it has not always been like this. It used to end at the Court of Appeal. However, it has been extended to the Supreme Court. Now, some elements of these petitions comprise issues of qualification of candidates and political party primaries. Even though a good number of these issues are categorized as pre-election matters, we have seen pre-election matters go all the way to the Supreme Court with similar issues pronounced by election tribunals or appellate courts as pre-election mat matters which are outside of their jurisdiction. We have also seen a general reluctance of the courts to dabble into the affairs of political parties in election petitions. Perhaps if political parties take great care to ensure fairness and transparency in their internal affairs, and their primary elections, some of these cases will be significantly reduced. Now, for election adjudication, there are several bills. There is one to reduce the time for tribunals to hear petitions from 180 days to 120 days. There is another bill to expedite elect presidential election petition with the Supreme Court having original jurisdiction to hear this matter and delivering its judgment within 65 days. Also, there is a bill to bestow original jurisdiction of governorship election petitions on the Court of Appeal with a right of appeal to the Supreme Court. And there is a bill to take away the powers of an election, peti election petition tribunal to declare a winner of an election where it invalidates the same election. The bill proposes instead for the, court, for the tribunal to make an order for the conduct of a by-election. Moving on to other bills, there is a bill for um, devolution of powers to bring shipping and navigation from the exclusive legislative list to the concurrent legislative list, which would mean that states can make laws over matters relating to shipping and navigation. 
Now, devolution of powers is usually a way for states to gain more resource control. In the last constitution review exercise in the Ninth National Assembly, um, there were bills to move electricity, railways, and custodial centers to the concurrent legislative list, and these passed. Now, it is up to the states to take advantage of these alterations to the constitution um, to enrich their own resources. Another bill is on referendum. It has been argued by, uh, or it, it has been proposed by secessionist agitators for Nigeria to hold a referendum. Now, there are other matters that may call for a referendum generally. Before the National Assembly, there is a bill for proposing that any proposal for constitution alteration or any decision on a matter of national or state level importance should be approved by a simple majority of eligible voters in a referendum conducted by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. This week on Constituency Focus, we speak to Senator Francis Faransi, representing Oshun East Senatorial District, on the quality of his representation of his people so far and future plans. In the last four years, which we, are, we have not even finished, just last week, we still did about two or three empowerment, which is, mm -hmm. which uh, no senator is even doing again. But nowadays, it should go beyond it. The power generation is poor now. The distribution is almost at zero. If the situation of power increase, improves, then we want small, small scale industries. We have to go further. Enough of uh, distributing 5,000, 5, which could not bring any development. If the state, like what also is doing now, also is now doing some major roles to connect the farmers, then our own would like to do feeder roads in conjunction with the local government. The local government now is working, at least in Osun. That's my area. My area is also east. That's if it is a senatorial district. Our problem now is the major road, that federal road that passed through through us to Ikiti, Ondo, and Kwara. So if those major roads could be done by the federal government, then we'll be okay. The remaining roads that we attract the farmers to come from the villages to town, that is our own problem, which is major. So we'll be able to cooperate with the state and federal, because we have been doing it, including bridges. Then well, we are going seriously to agree this year. Go so kind. The two ministers in agri are all agri part, and they are from Senate. So we have to go to meet, and we have met them to advance our own cause. Because the more we produce food, the more you, the less you see uh, villagers coming to town to disturb their peace. Then, mm -hmm. if there is power, we we'll now have to connect them to do a lot of uh, more of uh, artisan work, which we are trying to do now. We have provided enough uh, transformers, which at least there is no local government that got less than between five to ten out of eleven local government. We are still we are still doing it. Then the rural electrification is the problem, which is major, which we have to start begging the federal government. And I know under uh, President Tinubu who is someone from rural area too, we know how to assist us. 
And by the grace of God, before we finish this, you will see that the economy will improve. Without the economy of the rural area improving, there's nothing the cities can do. Well, this is where we wrap up the gavel this week. Remember to send feedback to the gavel at channelstv.com. I'm Terry Kumi. Goodbye.